All right, now we're joined by Anita Crawford-Willis, who's running for uh, re-election to Municipal Court Position 4. So go ahead with your two-minute introduction. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here this afternoon. Um, as, as Jeff said, my name is Anita Crawford-Willis. I am Seattle Municipal Court Judge Position 4, and I am uh, running to retain my position. Um, I'm a native of Seattle, born and raised in Seattle, grew up in the Central District, 43rd, and uh, have been in Seattle all my life, attended Seattle University, both for undergrad and law school. Um, I, as a young person, knew that I wanted to do something with my life to make a difference in the lives of people. I didn't know what that would look like until I went to a trial. Uh, my dad took me to watch a trial of my cousin who was a defendant, and watching the lawyer and how he helped my cousin really transformed my life, and at that moment I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I was a public defender for four years out of law school, enjoyed the work immensely. Um, I was encouraged by a judge. Um, I appeared before often in juvenile court that I should be a judge, and so I started on my journey. I was an administrative law judge for 26 years. I um, represented or held hearings, thousands of hearings. I then uh, also pro tem for 20 years, and I was appointed in 2016 to Seattle Municipal Court um, by the mayor. I always wanted to get back to Seattle Municipal Court because that's where I started my practice as a lawyer. I believe that it is a people's court. It's a place where I feel I can use my legal skills to make a difference in the lives of ordinary, everyday people because I feel most of the people that come before me, they find themselves there because they made a bad decision or their life circumstances have led them there. And so I believe this is a place where I can make a difference, I can touch lives, and maybe at some point work myself out of a job, but it's <laughs> where my passion is, and, and that's why I want to be there. Great, thank you. So now we have our four prepared questions that we're asking all candidates for municipal court, and they're right in front of you. If you want to okay. turn them over and read along as we read them yes. aloud, these are two-minute answers, and okay. then will you do number one? What barriers to access are there in the courts for unrepresented litigants, people with disabilities, and other vulnerable populations? And what steps have you taken to promote access to justice? Okay. Um, so some of the barriers, we first talk about unrepresented litigants. Um, I'm used to that from my days as an administrative law judge because most of our parties were pro se litigants. And so to me, um, one of the ways to steps to take to access that really is in the criminal court is first I would try to talk people out of wanting to be to represent themselves because it really is difficult you have to know the rules of evidence I mean I can't step in and do those things for them but if they don't uh, take my advice and they still want to represent themselves I think explain 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 the process to them at every step be patient um, don't allow them to be um, disrespected or, or kind of um, bullied by the lawyers and uh, just, you know, help them to feel that, that they're still getting their day in court and be impartial. And, and I think that's the best way to help um, unrepresented litigants. For um, parties with disabilities, we do try, our court is accessible, of course, so we have all the ADA requirements. Um, again, the same thing, to make sure that you have patience, because it might take longer, to make sure that people feel that they are being heard, that they do have access, and to provide whatever accommodations are necessary. Many times we have people that may be hard of hearing, so we have uh, earpieces that they can use. Whatever accommodation that we need to provide, that's what we, we provide and that, that I would make sure is provided for people um, with disabilities. And, and really, whatever the need, whatever arises that would make a person, if it's within reason, feel that they are being heard, that they have access to the courtroom, because that's that's a lot of it. Access doesn't, doesn't mean walking in there, but that when you're in there, you truly have access, you feel that you're being heard, and that you have a chance to tell your story. So whatever things are necessary to accommodate parties. Great. Clayton, number two. What state or federal Supreme Court <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, decisions do you disagree with the most? Hmm. Uh, well, I can't think of a particular case right now. 
But I can say, um, any, I, I would disagree with any cases that would put um, a burden on uh, parties to like pay fees, um, because I think that that is, uh, that's one area that really um, shows the difference between people who have money and people who don't have money. So um, there's one particular fee in our court that we don't have the ability to waive, and that's if someone is accused of certain crimes, they have to give a DNA swab, and there's a fee for that. Uh, many people, most of the people that have that fee, uh, many of them, they can't pay it, and that's one that we're not allowed to waive. And so that always bothers me because that has to follow them, even if they've done everything else in their case. If they don't pay that, then we it, it's just sitting there. It has to go to collections, and it just sits there. So any cases that would, and I know that we're working on cases to reverse that, to get rid of all LFOs, so I support those. But any cases that would um, say it's okay for those fees to be charged when people are clearly indigent, because I think that really, is a barrier and it, it's a difference between people that have money and people that don't. If you don't have money, then you have this burden that stays with you, basically. Um, so I can't think of a specific uh, case that I disagree with, but just in general. All right, David, number three. Uh, please describe your beliefs around the concept of restorative justice and whether you see a potential for judicial action from the bench as influential on that process. Um, absolutely. So restorative justice to me really um, means finding a holistic approach to dealing with people that come before me. And I believe that there's not a one, one fit for everybody that really there's, we should customize, um, customize the um, sentence that you give someone and that we should be looking at alternatives to jail time for people. Uh, we should deal with the things, the issues that bring them before our court. We see homelessness, uh, mental illness that have, have not been addressed or maybe have been addressed but aren't being addressed consistently, people with drug addictions. And so this, these are the things that bring people to our court. So I really believe restorative justice uh, plays into that, looking at the person as a whole and seeing what can we do for this person that would help them to get past this so that they could be a productive citizen. And to that end, we have a uh, court resource center at our court that I have really been actively involved in where we bring in partners outside of the court to help us address many issues. So we have people from DSHS there. We have people, uh, you can get an ORCA card, you can get your social security card, you can work on getting your ID. Recently, I was involved with bringing uh, the Urban League. They have a job prep program. They're a partner with us also. So I think the, all of those things um, tie into restorative justice. We're not just saying, you know, you did this and so we're gonna punish you by sending you to jail or, or assessing fines, but we're gonna look at what brought you here we're gonna to try to help you so that you don't come back here, not only not come back here, but you can go out and lead a productive life. And so to me, that's what restorative justice is. And really that's why I wanted to be at the court because I want to be a part uh, of that and making a difference in the lives of people. Please share an incident or aspect of your work history that has changed or enhanced your interpretation of the law. I would say um, really just um, hearing the stories of the many people that um, have come before me over the years, not just here, but even as an administrative law judge, you know, that also is like a people's court because we, do, we dealt with everyday issues, you know, DSHS, whether people got food or insurance, employment security, whether they got money to pay their bills, and so our court now to me is the same. It's like a, a, a people's court in every day. And so what I'm always reminded of is I hear the stories of people that come before me is that, you know, that could be me, but for certain things that, that happened, but, but for, you know, me having um, a parents that, that uh, nurtured me and, and, and showed me the right path, but for me having a good education, but for me it could go on and on. 
that could be me. And so I'm always, when I'm sitting and listening uh, to the things that people have gone through, what brought them there, I always keep that in the, in the back of my mind. And I think that that has been like a guiding light for me as I'm, um, you know, making my decisions, as I'm deciding what I'm gonna do on a case. So I think like overall, my whole work experience um, has really guided me and, and, and helped me in interpreting of the law. And you know, the law is the law. So sometimes, you know, within the law, I have to follow the law, but I have uh, leeway in terms of how I'm going to deal with that, what the sentence is gonna be, what I'm going to do going forward past that. And so I think that's what's guided me is just thinking about that it could have been me. And I always tell parties that come before me that I'm not judging you as a person because I know that you're a good person, but I am here to judge the behavior and how can we move forward. Great, so now we'll open up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers, and we'll start with Clayton. <clears throat> um, we're going to get a new uh, juvenile detention facility. Mm -hmm. If you were in charge of, of the process of putting that building together, mm -hmm. how would you how would you structure um, who would you involve, and how would you structure the programming of that facility? Because because the programming happens before the design work is done, mm -hmm. and it's crucial to the character of mm -hmm. the result. Great question, and and I love juvenile court. I practiced at juvie uh, when I was a public defender, and I mean I'm very passionate about uh, children and children's issues. Spent um, 20 years volunteering with Boys and Girls Club, um, and again going back to what I talked about of making a difference. I mean that is really where you can make a difference in the lives of young people at that age. So for me, I think you probably could guess. The programming would be all about rehabilitation and finding ways to help them move past whatever brought them there, finding ways to help them be successful and as they go out, uh, you know, finding ways to help them get involved in school if they want to, apprenticeship programs, uh, counseling, whatever they need. That's, to me, that should be the cornerstone of what that uh, building looks like. So it should be partners like our Court Resource Center. I would want all kinds of community partners there that could address all of those issues. Whatever issue that child had when they came in, we should have those people in that building to address those issues. I think it should all be about, for juveniles, it should all be about rehabilitation and helping them move forward. So that would be my what I would design if I had the choice to design it. So related question, mm -hmm. do you support the construction of a new youth jail in Seattle? Of that jail? Um, so I don't, I don't support construction in terms of thinking we should lock up kids. Um, I do think that we need to have, they need to have, for the ones that are there, they do need to have a better place. I worked at Juvie what, 20, 25, 26 years ago? And that building is was bad then. <laughs> and it's still the same building. Um, so I, I support them having a new building because they need they do need to do business, but I don't think it should be built with in terms of thinking about we are gonna build all this space to lock kids up. I think it should be a building built with rehabilitation in mind, with all the good things that we can do to help kids get a good start and continue continue on and be successful in life. So I think that's what the building should be comprised of. Now there is all, there are always going to be a small amount of, of people. That's at anything that um, perhaps do need to be kept away from the general population. But I don't think that building should. And and I don't know what their rationale because I haven't followed it that much. But I don't think it should be built to lock up kids. I don't think that's the answer. Additional questions. Uh, uh, when you uh, mentioned, uh, I, I think what you said, your dad took each of your cousins yes. to trial. Yes. Um, and the impact that had mm -hmm. uh, 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 struck a chord. I had a high school teacher who took us on a field trip mm -hmm. to a trial. Mm -hmm. and, and that experience has been with me ever yes. since. Yes. 
And I'm just wondering how what we might expose more young people to what goes on in a courtroom. I think that is a great idea. So our court actually uh, has a youth court. It's run through Garfield High School and the kids come and um, do the youth court at our court. But personally, I have been involved. I'm, a mentorship is a really big part of who I am. Um, so I have been involved with mentoring young people all the way from you know grade school all the way up to law school and people that are interested in law, exposing them to law. So having them come sit with me at work, um, have just talking to them about the law, actually helping them go through the process of filling out their applications. I think it is so important to expose young people to um, all different kinds of work because I would have never, you know, my parents were blue collar workers, so they didn't know anything about lawyers and how to be a lawyer and, and I, I would, didn't have any exposure. So it wasn't until my dad took me there that I said, that's what I wanna do. Um, so I think that is so important. And I try to do that um, just on my own is something that I do, but I think it's something that the courts should definitely do. Judges should be out in the community educating people about what we do. So that's a great um, idea. And we do that um, with our youth court, but we can do even more, I'd like to. Thank you. you. Thank you. Jason, Great question. Yes. Jason's next. Okay. Um, Seattle prosecutors are seeking to vacate more than 540 convictions against people carrying caught co carrying small amounts of pot before legalization. Uh, do you believe this policy should be expanded upon to include more marijuana offenses? More than? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it would depend on which offenses you're talking about, but I certainly support it for the marijuana. Yes. Uh, and more so, marijuana offenses other oh more other mm -hmm. yes I, I, I do support it uh, because it's based on the uh, disproportionality of people that were cited for that uh, you know of course disproportionality for African Americans and other people of color so I do support that thank you so where do you see the courts in our justice system with the prevailing winds 20 years from now, you know, prison reform, sentencing reform, you know, what kind, maybe a future perfect, like the scenario you said where you put yourself out of work. Mm -hmm. Well, one area that we're working on right now, um, as you said, the bail reform, um, and that's something that I'm very interested in too. I was at the jail when I initially started um, my uh, tenure at the court, and um, I can tell you that I PR'd a lot of people, <laughs> and I also sent people to our day reporting, which is an opportunity to go to day reporting in lieu of having to um, pay a bill. So I think that is so important for us to find creative ways to get people back to court, because I think studies have shown that putting a bail um, doesn't make somebody come back to court. I mean, when you think about it, if somebody doesn't have a home, I mean, you know, it's hard to for them to put that as a priority all the time that I gotta get back to court because they're worrying about where they're going to sleep the night before. So we are thinking about creative ways. You know, we have in our court resource center, people can get a cell phone. So we're thinking about, you know, like when your dentist sends you a text message about your court date the next day. I mean, we, we are starting to think about what are creative ways that we can remind people to come back and make their court dates. So I think bail reform is a big one that's gonna be going on for a while and I'm very supportive of that idea and have already in my own way um, tried to implement that. Time for probably a, one short question, please. Um, <clears throat> uh, I wonder if you could tell us what your reaction was to the repeal of, of the of crucial parts of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by the Roberts Court. Um, I have to say that I'm, I don't know, I'm not familiar exactly the with the rights areas Act. that you're talking about. You talk about the Voting Rights Act? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So, of course, you know, I have, personally, I have is, have took issue with that. I'm not sure, I mean, that's not something that would necessarily come before me at, on a municipal court level. Yeah. But, um... 
So I, I don't know how far well, I can it's a answer it, but it's a yeah, I, of course, you know, I'm <laughs> not happy with that. And it concerns me, you know, mm -hmm. things eroding, things that have been already won <laughs> going backwards. So it's definitely a concern. Indeed it is. Yeah. That's one of the parts of the job that's kind of difficult being a judge. We can't, you can't really talk about stuff that you want to. <laughs> one of the one of the uh, things we give up. That's why I have to start right here. <laughs> All right, we're about out of time. If you want to take thirty seconds for a closing statement. Well, I just want to say thank you. I feel um, like the thirty-six, like you had a part of me getting my appointment because I met um, the governor at your event uh, in the summer of um, I think it was the summer of two thousand sixteen. Um, and so from there, you know, I went through my process. So I always like to say that you guys are a big uh, part of the reason that I um, ended up being appointed by the governor. So, so thank you. And thank you for um, spending this time with me. Thank you very much. Thank you.